So hello, everyone. And um, thank you all for joining us this evening to meet with four of the 12 scholars that you saw in the video um, for this inaugural year of the Obama Foundation Scholars Program here at Columbia University. Um, I'm Lisa Hancock, and I manage the program. And I'm very excited to have you meet um, these four amazing leaders from France, Tunisia, Paraguay, and Colombia, who are participating in the program this year. The goal of the Obama Foundation Scholars Program, and I touched on it in the video, is to identify rising social change leaders from around the world and provide them with an opportunity to gain new insights, new perspectives, and tools to help them accelerate the impact of their work when they return home. Um, the four scholars that you're going to meet today are founders of organizations, um, uh, nonprofits or social enterprises. And this event tonight is a wonderful opportunity for them to share with you not only their work, but also the journeys that they took in order to be able to establish um, the organizations that they all lead. Um, they are all taking unique um, approaches to addressing critical challenges in their communities, in their home countries. And um, I think you're going to be uh, inspired, I know I am, uh, by, by their work um, and by their stories. Um, so I want to thank Damon Phillips and the Tamer Center for Social Enterprise for partnering with the program in this inaugural year um, in order to make um, this event happen. So thank you very much. And um, uh, I'm going to turn it over to Damon. So good evening, everyone. How are you? Good. good, good, good. So I'm really glad to be here with you and just really feel fortunate to have this opportunity to share this evening. So first of all, um, it was an amazing video, guys. And, um, but it also makes me think about how fortunate we are as Columbia University that, that you spent this year with us. So um, um, I'm going to go ahead and, and get into the, the evening. We have this really, really nice uh, event set up, as you know. Um, and I want to explain a little bit more about sort of what my role here is. My name is Damon Phillips, as Lisa said. I'm a co-director of the Tamer Center for Social Enterprise. It's in the, it's in the business school. And um, I'm the, I, I co-lead it with, with Bruce Usher and, uh, and Sandra Navali here uh, in, in, the, in the front row. So the Tamer Center at the Columbia Business School, we, um, we advance the understanding of how business can contribute to society. Um, in, the, in, in the environment. So we do that by emphasizing the vital role that social enterprise can play in transforming communities. Uh, we've been acting on this mission uh, more broadly by drawing upon um, all of uh, Columbia's uh, interdisciplinary perspectives, uh, the faculty and student talent that we have here, um, as well as our location here in New York City. Uh, the center is also one of the keys to the university's engagement um, across campus, so this, this includes um, principally the uh, Bo uh, President Bollinger's uh, Columbia World Projects. Um, and that, for those of you who may not know, many, many of you may know, but it's a cross-disciplinary initiative uh, really across uh, all the schools of Columbia University that draws research and expertise and targets that um, what we have in the university to address global social and environmental issues. Um, the center, in the center, we have this tradition that we have of training leaders um, who understand that the broader context and the role of um, business involves uh, this idea of business and society, and we take that very, very seriously in terms of what we do. So we see in this how the business and investor community has been increasingly directing their attention to positive contributions to society on topics such as climate change, uh, mass incarceration, uh, and um, educational reform, among, among others. Now, one reason why we are particularly excited about this evening is um, one of our main activities is supporting social entrepreneurship and social ventures. It's really integral to what, what, we, what we do. So, for example, we have a, a social venture advisory network, and that's a network of professionals, uh, experts, uh, alumni, who come from all over the Columbia community and they are a vital part of the ecosystem that we have here for, for social entrepreneurs. We also have something called the Tamer Fund for Social Ventures, and that provides C grants of $25,000 to nonprofit, for-profit, or hybrid early stage social and environmental ventures, um, those that have a Columbia affiliation. And to date, we've funded 26 
uh, ventures through, through that fund. Um, so um, on behalf of uh, the Tamer Center, we, as I said, we are pleased, excited, thrilled to have this opportunity to partner with Columbia World Projects on this, on this event and I um, hope we can continue this tradition uh, beyond, uh, after this point. I'm really looking forward to hearing the insights, the impact of the inaugural cohort. Um, and for those that I won't have a chance to, to formally meet this evening, I hope in the next few weeks we get a chance to, to chat a bit. So um, uh, thank you again, and um, we'll move on to the next uh, part of the program. Um, the next speaker is Gabriela Galeo. And um, I'll let her talk about her, her venture, Okimo Vision. That's fantastic, you'll see. I'm gonna tell you a personal story tonight. That girl is me when I was two years old. Um, I show you this picture because that was when my parents found out that I have a disease called strabismus. It means that my eyes are not aligned, but it also means that I don't see in 3D. I don't see the depth of things. So how is that like, you might ask? Well, try to, try to imagine doing everything but just using one eye. Reading an entire book, uh, driving a car, driving a bike, or trying to solve a very complex math equation in which you actually have to pay attention to every single number and sign before and after with the clock ticking like a GMAT test, for example, and just using one eye. Yes, I usually got the results all wrong, and I usually did not have the opportunity to go back and, and check if I missed something because my eyes were not both working at the same time. One in five children in the world have a problem that affects their ability to learn just as I do. But diagnosing these learning problems is a time-consuming and inexpensive task because you would need educational psychologists or specialists to do so, and many schools lack these resources. Even in the US, you would need several sessions that can cost $120 to $200 to diagnose these problems, and parents maybe don't have that money. That's why we created Okimo. Okimo is software that can detect developmental and learning problems anywhere, even though there's no specialist or you don't have the money to pay for it, at a third of the current market price, because you don't need one. How do we do this? First of all, we want to make a visual evaluation because we don't know if children actually can see the board or read a book. You might, might think that this is obvious, but in the US, two out of three children never get a visual screening before entering school. So if they don't see, no one will know. And then we do a reading screening that is based on movement, eye movements analysis. We do this by using a sensor called eye tracker. The sensor collects eye movements uh, from children that are reading a text. And with this biometric data, we can calculate <coughs> metrics like reading speed, word and letter recognition, time frames, uh, time frames and, and so on. We do this in three phases. The first phase is a screening that we do for every single child in the school. So we train facilitators or community workers in just two hours, they can learn how to use the software to screen everyone. And then we detect who are the children that have red flags and show risks that would need to be confirmed. And so we bring specialists to the schools to, to confirm these risks. And the third phase is a treatment. If they need eyeglasses, we give eyeglasses to them. If they need reading interventions, we create the reading interventions from them, for them. It only takes 10 minutes to do this test. Um, we just need a facilitator, as I told you, we can train them in two hours, a laptop and an eye tracker, and we can do up to seven, ch six children per hour. So this is pretty scalable. And what is most important, we can, we can uh, create a dashboard in which any school principal or school district can see how many children were screened, what were the problems found, and what is most important, what are the resources that need to be deployed in the field. What is our secret sauce? We have been building machine learning algorithms that can detect reading patterns and predict risks from a large volume of data. And this is patent pending at the moment. We did many pilots in developed countries like the UK and Spain, but also in developing countries. 
And what really struck our, our attention is a pilot we did last year in Paraguay, which is where I come from, in which we found out that more than 50% of students in third grade were not reading a word per minute. So actually our metric for reading speed was not useful because they were not even recognizing letters. So then we found out that this is not a tool to, all, to only detect children that have learning disabilities. This is a tool to actually help everyone understand if a child has the building blocks that are needed to learn how to read. So I'm here today because I'm an Obama scholar, as you just heard. Um, and this is a one-year residential program in which we can learn the skills and, and, and get the, the contacts that are needed to advance our work. And I want to share with you what I've learned at Columbia and what, what was possible thanks to this opportunity. What is most important to me is that before coming to Columbia, I did not have the opportunity to work with top uh, researchers from around the world that were at universities, I, I believe universities like this one, that could validate our work from a scientific point of view. And so thanks to, to this opportunity, I was able to do so by closing academic partnerships. Like for example, Last week, we just, we just closed a partnership with the Earth Institute. They are running a literacy program in Telangana, India. And I want to tell that Telangana, India is the district in India that has the worst educational outcomes in the whole country. And they can teach children how to read in just 100 days. But by using Okimo now, they will be able to measure the effectiveness and the progress of the, of, the, of the tools that they are deploying in the field using real biometric data for the first time. That is one of the things that was possible thanks to this fellowship. We're also working with the Teachers College and Data Science Institute students to help perfectionate this machine learning algorithm. And right now, they are digging into the data collected in our previous pilots because we want to answer new questions. And last but not least, I'm also working with Columbia World Projects that, as it was mentioned, is, is seeking to bring research into the real world to solve problems. And we're trying to build a framework in which I'll use all of the experience gained deploying uh, Okimo in the field to understand how can startups, academia, and governments can work together to bring solutions to people in need anywhere in any country. I want to leave you with a final note today, and is you know this, technology is changing the way we access to care. So we want to make sure that we use this opportunity to make it accessible to everyone in the world. So if you're a student or an impact investor, or a teacher that know about a grant or a program and that can help us and want to be part of this story, get in touch with me at the end. Thank you. Thank you, Gabriela. That was great. Um, let me see. So our next speaker is Ana Maria Gonzalez Ferrero, and she's going to uh, talk about FEM, her amazing organization. Okay, so I know this is a weird way to begin a presentation, um, especially when people do know about business. But that's the reality. Um, six years ago, um, my organization went back to being a desk in my living room. Um, I'm not going to talk to you in much detail about why. It's because corruption in my country and uh, some uh, very um, in it, like, like um, wrong and equivocal ways to assign funds by big um, uh, funding sources. But that's not the point. The point is that, again, all my volunteers, the team, everybody was having lunch in my house every day. Yet, if you think about the issue that I'm trying to tackle, you really don't get it why it's going on, why this is really happening. Because what we do is we file land title solicitations for people within the Constitution of 1991 of Colombia that gives land to indigenous and Afro people forever. And when I say forever, I'm not exaggerating. I mean forever. It cannot be taken back by banks or by the state once it's given to them. And the place where I am is right in the middle of the circle, the city of Cartagena, that's where our organization works. 
And the reason why we work there is because I think the circle is quite obvious. Don't you think that there's something missing there? Like if the pattern of the country is the way it is in the peripheries, the land is owned by the Afro and indigenous communities. And the area where I am has more or less the same population as the orange area on the south of it. Why isn't there any land allotted to indigenous populations there? Why is there no collective land property within that circle? That's the reason why we had no funding. So again, I'm going to talk about what we did, not about the structural problems that bring about this situation because you would be get very bored and would, we, you would get very worried about the future of my country. So what we did is we created a tour operator. We thought, well, what is the easiest thing that we can do in the place where we are, having the most opportunities possible? And that was definitely using Cartagena as a touristic city that it is in our favor. So we created a salsa experience, and then a visit to the marketplace, and then visits to the communities, and visits to handcrafts. And the great thing about this model is that it distributes money between our organization, the leaders of the communities in which we work, who act as guides, and the communities themselves. So we, we really have like, a, and, and, you can, and you can see it in our reviews in TripAdvisor, we really are committed into putting the money from the, from the tourist market into the money of the communities that usually don't have access to that because tourism is very concentrated. So this happened. So it made a little bit of sense to do this, right? It's, it started giving us a little bit of money. And please, I want you to take note, I'm here not talking about our, op, like our operational funding. It's about the sustaining of an organization which costs a lot of money and nobody is able to fund it. So that's where we were. And then because we had now realized that there was a market for this, so we opened a hostel. We got investors that came and believed in what we did. And we created a hostel in the city center of Cartagena. It was the funniest thing. I used to have a house in, off the city center of Cartagena, a tiny house in the hippest neighborhood in the world, according to the New York Times, called Hetzemani. And they, one day the, the landowner just calls me and says, I'm going to double your rent. And I said, OK, fine. Just let me do a little experiment. And I put it in Airbnb to see if it could self-fund. And it did. But it only had four beds. So, and it was tiny. But with that model, we got an investor, and we opened one. And we went from four beds to 30 beds. And that's Volunteer Hostel. And that's what's open right now. And you can go. I mean, it's there, right? So this happened, right? It's starting to make sense. And then this happened. This was weird. We get a call from a three Australian guys. Australia is on the opposite side of the planet, my god. And they're like, we saw you on the internet. We really like your project. We want to invest in Colombia. And we thought it would be a good idea to invest with you guys. I was like, what? What is that? International investor calling us? Yeah, we want to open a cafe. We don't know how. We don't know what the laws in Colombia are about. We don't know. So we need help to do it. But we think that you are a perfect partner. Really? OK. So the cafe was opened. And this happened. The cafe is the, big, the best of all. Like, and they're very good business people. We were learning with the tour operator. Now it's better. But, but they are business people. So this happened, right? And all of these things are active and going in Cartagena. So that's more or less the story I want to tell you. But what I really want to say here is that suddenly we realized that, yes, we had to continue doing the land solicitation part. Of course, the core mission of FEM is land forever, remember? That's what we're looking for. And now, because I am an Obama scholar, I'm probably going to be able to access funding easier for that mission. But then we might, it might make sense, too, to create another mission, which would be to harness the power of capitalism in our favor, which I must say I had not the slightest clue that could be a possibility before having started. I would never have said this until I did it. See what I mean? Like I, would have, I was distrustful of capitalism and of the market, and everything is going to be, right? And see how my life just turned out? <laughs> 
So we said, let's try it and let, let's experiment this. And let's try it, not with us, but let's try the model on a, on, a, on a group of people from the communities to see if it works. And so this happened. This is a craft seller. Uh, instead of selling the, they make these beautiful lamps. Those lamps, the market price of those lamps in Cartagena would be like $18. We're actually selling them in Denmark for $65. So, and they, this little company benefits 11 families but it benefits 11 families by changing their lives. They can now stay in their neighborhood, work near their house, take care of their children, preserve their culture, and get income, right? So it's the power of these small companies that we think it can be game-changing. So, um, and again, remember that the mission of FEM is intact. Like, we still have to keep on looking for funding for land forever. We still think that this should also happen. And that we need to lead an ecosystem that creates an, a better middle class for Colombia, which lacks an indigenous and Afro middle class. And the Colombians that are with me here in this room know that in Colombia, you don't see a middle class black woman. That doesn't exist. Women, by definition, Black women, by definition, almost in Colombia, are poor. If they are in the middle class, they are a huge exception. And they're a demonstration of the struggle. So we want that to become more common. Indigenous women, even more. So, so we created this incubator. And the incubator pairs people with very huge talents with people like you guys. You have a little bit of money. You're not millionaires. You have a little bit of money. And you know business. You know management. You know the basics. That's all we needed for all this, the basics. And it's people that are willing to put their money where their heart is. So it's, it's a model where this pairing takes place. And so we strongly believe that it's now your turn. There's so many things that you can do first. You can invest in helping us uh, make the incubator bigger. We need a team for the incubator in itself, because remember, FEM has a team for land litigation. We really have to develop the business model for this one. You can partner with a project. Some of our projects have cost less than $2,000. The initial investment for the tour operator was $1,700. So um, you can really have good ideas that can, are game changing. And if you travel to Cartagena and help them development and put your meat in the fryer with the people, it's going to work. It's going to work. And if that's too much to ask, just uh -huh. please travel to Colombia, stay in our hostel, eat the delicious food we make in the cafe, Take the tours. They are a little bit more expensive. You know now why. They're a little bit more expensive than the average. You can check it in TripAdvisor. A ticket to Colombia today, I checked it like three days ago, $175 from New York, just so that you know. <laughs> and please, always remember to put your money where your heart is. Definitely, there's one power that we now have that is the purchasing power. And we have to be consistent. Use that power wisely. Buy where you should. Thank you. That's awesome. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our, um, <laughs> our fourth speaker is uh, Omazine Khalifa, and she's going to I talk about her um, Mabdium, yes. Mabdium? Yes. Thank you. Yes. Okay, please put the slide. Yes, so one slide. Just press this to go forward. Yes? Yeah. Yes. Hello. Hi. Hi. Hello. My name is Omezin Khalifa. There. I come from Tunisia this friendly, sunny, gorgeous country in North Africa. And are there some engineers in the room? 
One, two, yes. Why people? <laughs> Are there some finance people in the room? One, two, okay, four people. You guys are my people. Nine years ago, I was a telecommunication engineer. I was working in finance, and I was living in one of the most beautiful cities on earth, Paris. But my life was a little boring. So I was waking up, going to work in a packed metro. I was going up the building of my workplace in packed elevators. I was sitting in front of my computer, writing emails, answering calls, contributing to this amazing job of making more profit for the corporation I was working for. Actually, every day I felt restless. I felt that I was not having an added value to this world. I felt I was like a drop in the ocean. So one day in December 2011, actually 2010, I was sitting at my computer desk at home in Paris. I was scrolling through my Facebook newsfeed to see some of the news of my family and friends back home in Tunisia. That day was a different day. Someone posted a live video of a teenager filming himself in a protest that turned to be a nightmare. So he was running, trying to escape what seemed to be bullets, live bullets, being shot by policemen. <clears throat> there were people around him, smoke, fumes, running, screaming. He succeeded to hide behind a wall, still filming, we were seeing the scene. His friend went next to him. He was wounded, blood was in his leg. And it was happening in a remote area of my country. I was shocked. Never in my life have I witnessed any kind of protest. But this was worse. Women, men, youth were shot by the police. Unprecedented. I was so confused. I didn't know it then. But it was the beginning of the Arab uprisings. So in this confusion, I talked to family, I talked to family members, friends, just to understand what was going on. I thought I should be doing something. I could not do business as usual. I should be like involving in something. Some of my friends, Tunisian youth, diaspora, who were also living in Paris from my engineering school, started to mobilize. They said we should march in Paris. We should mobilize online as well. They understood very quickly that as youth diaspora, we had a vital role to play, to make the youth voices of our country heard around the world. We cannot leave the brutality of the regime, just be unseen. My father was visiting me then, so I shared with him my intention to participate in one of the meetings to organize the mobilization marches. He said to me, you're very naive. You don't understand that the meetings you're talking about, the marches you want to involve in, will be full of undercover cops. Even if you are here in Paris, their mission will be to identify you because you're now a threat to the regime and you will be listed as a terrorist and never will you be able to go back home. So of course, <laughs> the voice of the wisdom, I kept quiet, I stayed home, safe, and I remember very clearly that day, 8th of January 2011. I was sitting in a restaurant with a couple of friends, and they were following a little bit the situation in Tunisia, and they asked me about it. So I shared, like, my intention, my doubts, and, and their reaction just blew my mind. These guys, told me that if I felt so bad about the youth being shot in my home country, I should not stay quiet. I was in France, in the country of human rights, and I should feel safe to protest. Of course, they were French, they knew nothing about the political situation and the risks in my country. But they were the first ones who spoke to my feelings. That day, 
they made me realize that me being scared was very selfish. That the cause was bigger than my own safety and security. That it was a duty to march and protest in France because people were killed back home. So while we were discussing, I made up my mind and I decided I was going to march. That day, I, <laughs> before I, actually before I went to march, I just put on a hat, wore sunglasses, rolled a woolen scarf around my face. I wanted to be anonymous. <laughs> and then I took the metro and I went to the buildings of the French television where big crowds were already gathering. And in the middle of the crowd, I meet a childhood friend from Tunisia. And it was really crazy. He was exactly like as I left him. He had curly hair. He was messy, artsy style. He was grinning, completely bareheaded and recognizable. And he came, hugged me, and we were catching up. And while we were like trying to understand who was doing what and why in Paris and why here, and a journalist came and, and asked us to speak in front of the camera. I don't know, maybe he liked that we were happy. Uh, so my friend Sammy told me, hey, you should go. You always have an opinion and you, should, you would be brilliant. And I told him, hey, look at me, I'm anonymous. I'm so scared. I'm not supposed to be here. And he told me, you know, he like shook me like from the shoulders. He looked me in the eyes. He told me, on the scene, from now on, no more fear. And he walked off. He just stood in front of the camera and I was watching him. He spoke uh, and I looked around me and he was so right. You know, I was surrounded not only by Tunisians, but by Algerians, Moroccans, Libyans, Lebanese, Egyptians, French. People were there, all recognizable, all holding signs, all in solidarity with our youth in Tunisia. And, you know, I removed the hat, I removed the sunglasses, because I felt I was home. I found my people, the people who were courageous, brave to be there, and to say no to police brutality, no to violence, and no, we don't shoot peaceful protesters who are just demanding jobs, freedom, and dignity. So that day, I didn't feel anymore like a, just a drop in the ocean. I became the ocean. So since that day, I left my life in Paris. I came back home to Tunisia to help in the transition efforts. I did many things, politics, policies, and now, in civil society. I actually dedicate my life to help teenagers continue the movement peacefully and creatively because we need leaders. We need leaders to build the nation democracy in Tunisia, North Africa. Thank you. <laughs>